thanks so much for being here. And I, I do want to um, reiterate the thanks that you just gave to so many of the Blue Sky folks. Um, David loved the Blue Sky Gallery, and he would have been so honored by this show. I especially want to thank Chris Rauschenberg, who printed all of these photos from the digital files that I sent him. David had edited the images and never had a chance to print them. They are on his website, but uh, Chris did a terrific job of printing them. And as Chris, is it Christine, is that right? Mentioned, not Christine. Kristen, Kristen, thank you. As Kristen mentioned, um, all of them for sale are, are for sale, and David's share of the profits is going directly to the Friends of African Village libraries in, in this village. So I'm, I'm really happy for, to Blue Sky for helping to set that up. Um, also, a word of thanks to C for helping to organize this. What a beautiful job um, you did. I'm, I'm really honored that this is a memorial exhibit. As I mentioned, David loved Blue Sky Gallery very much, and he, he was so happy with the 2014 show of the work from this village. He, he would have been really happy with this. He died two years ago um, of leukemia, and I think it's important to say that this was his most sustained photographic project. He, he worked on the project in this village for 10 years. Every year during that period, he spent two to three months in the village. And it was a very powerful and meaningful experience for him to spend that time with the village. I thought it was interesting um, that the, the show in the front of the gallery is focused on community and membership as part of a community. And even though you don't see people, you don't see portraits in this particular set of images. David's work on the village was really all about community. It was about the vibrance and beauty and vitality of life in community in a village that had no electricity, no running water when he first went, no cell phone contact. Um, and he was, he was really captured by the, 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 the meaningful life in community, even under those difficult circumstances. And his goal with this larger project was to counter the negative portrayal of life in Africa that one often sees in the Western media. It's not all poverty. It's not all illness. It's not all war, although there certainly are poverty, illness, and war. But what, what he loved so much was the, the, the beauty and the, the, the sense of community and working together that he saw in that village. This particular series, the, um, the ancien village, the old village, the ancient village, the original village, different ways to, um, to um, interpret that, this is the portion of the village that was first built, and there's a more recent section of the village adjacent to this. But he was impressed with the way that the, the walls would crumble, but they were repaired, and that the people would continue to live in these, these older homes, some of which were built um, 100 years ago. He did a number of other series of work in the village. The, there's a series on the market day. Once a week, people from all around the region would gather for a, a market um, exchange of goods and food. There, there was a Friday night dance. Even though there was no electricity, there was a generator and a DJ and beautiful, lively music and a, a, an incredible dance that David would, would photograph with his flash. So. Um, not much other light in, although people would dance with flashlights in their hands so they could see each other dance. But gorgeous photos with the flash of the Friday night dance as he danced with them. Um, the Sur La Route photos, right outside of the house that he stayed in, which um, I'll say more about in a minute, it was Michael and Leslie's house in the village. Um, People would walk past every day on their way home from the fields 
carrying firewood, carrying the corn that they would be preparing, and they would wait for him to photograph him, they, for them. He, they knew that he would be there with his camera as the light faded and the, the sunset began. And he, that was the photo, that was the series that was here at Blue Sky in 2014. He did a series on the um, gold mines that started it, near the village um, uh, in the last few years that he was there. Gold was discovered and there was a lot of interest, first in sort of like the, the California 49ers digging holes under the ground and cl climbing down and looking for gold, and then later sifting the, the earth from the soil to, to find gold in the fields. He also did a series on the brick quarry, which was just outside of the village. Um, a large quarry, the Karaba brick quarry, uh, teams of men from the village would use picks and shovels to carve out these gorgeous bricks, which were then used for the homes and the walls. Some of the walls and homes here are made of adobe, mud and dry, dried mud. Um, other homes, I think like the, um, probably the mosque that's over there, are made with more solid bricks. And they carved the bricks out of this quarry. I was interested in the way that the, David's work on this village, which he called the architecture of the ancient village, echoed in some ways the the, the reverse of architecture that you see in the quarry. As you carve out the bricks, you create a kind of shadow architecture. So I, I wrote a little essay at the end of the catalog um, about the architecture in the quarry and the architectural um, sense in these images. So he did several um, series based on this village. Uh, an unfinished series was on rituals and shamans. He, um, he did visit a number of shamans in the area and he, he photographed funerals and he did not finish that editing project. So that's kind of an unfinished project that's still on his computer but um, not, not completed. A number of these have been shown in, at different museums in different places. The quarry work was shown in Venice as part of the Biennale in 2019, which was a real high point for him, really exciting. Um, the village didn't have electricity or running water, although apparently there's some electricity now, but um, it did have a library, and that's really important. Um, Several years ago, Michael Cavain and Leslie Gray did research in the village and as a way of, of honoring the, the hospitality of the village, they asked, what can we do to help you? And the community asked them if they would create a library. So they started a, an NGO called Friends of African Village Libraries, FAVL, and now there are, many libraries throughout this region and other parts of West Africa. Michael will talk a bit about Favel and about Burkina Faso and about the politics and um, tensions in Burkina Faso now in a minute, but I just want to say that in 20, 2007, Michael and Leslie invited David to join them in the village and to photograph the libraries that were nearby. Part of the goal was to um, have more images for the website. And David went, he didn't speak any French. He, um, he, uh, he was, I think, a bit unprepared for the, the heat and the mosquitoes, um, but he really was enraptured and entranced by the people and the place and during the next year, he studied French so that he could speak it well enough to be understood. And he, as I mentioned, he went back every year for 10 years. Um, so let's see, maybe I can turn to Michael now. Um, and then we'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, and I'll give you this mic. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we, we did introduce you. Michael Kvade. <laughs> and, and I'm an economist, and it's the first time I've given a talk in a, a gallery, so <laughs> it's a little intimidating. Um, <laughs> But I want to say, sitting in the back there and having been in Portland for a day and a half in the drizzle, um, I want to say the blue skies in these images <laughs> look really warm and inviting. And I want to commend uh, Chris, if he's here, for just amazing variations in the blues here. It's just really striking. Almost every image has a blue sky. Just these two, I think, don't. It's really nice to see. Um, so I have a few just remarks that I wanted to say, and then, and then I think Diane and I will be happy to take you know, questions that you might have. Um, uh, some of you are familiar, perhaps, with the, the musical uh, Brigadoon uh, that was uh, recently parodied as Schmigadoon uh, by the cast of Saturday Night Live. It's about a small Scottish village that uh, magically appears out of the mist every 100 years. And uh, Gene Kelly and Van Johnson uh, stumble into the village, uh, find Sid Charisse there. Uh, and they find a lot of dancing and music uh, uh, and the old way of life. Uh, and Bariba is not like Brigadoon that much, but it is a little bit like Brigadoon. There's a lot of music and dancing all the time, uh, under the stars, in the moonlight. And David, like many visitors to the village, uh, myself included, and Leslie back there, just entranced by that aspect of, uh, of the village. Uh, especially in the months after the harvest, um, you'll have uh, generator-powered uh, modern music, but also traditional uh, balafon music, which is a kind of large wooden uh, marimba xylophone that's played locally throughout uh, West Africa. And there's lots of teens and young adults uh, who are looking for, for love and entertainment and adventure uh, in the night. Uh, and there's lots of younger kids, 11 years old, 12 years old, 9 years old, who go out and imitate their older peers and are learning all the latest dance moves uh, in the music. It's really, it's really wonderful. There are, in this village, a lot of wise elders um, who are trying to guide the young people uh, on the right path. And there are imams, like in the mosque uh, over there, and there are pastors who are trying to share the, the good book with people in the, the good books, I should say, with people uh, in the village. There are earth priests and shamans and healers uh, who know a story and a purpose uh, for every tree and every plant and every place in the landscape. Um, and uh, believe it or not, uh, because uh, it's in the tropics, there is, however, a low-lying river that gets misty and cold in the, in the mornings. Uh, and uh, in the old days, when people would go across this low-lying riverbed, they would wrap themselves up in a hand-spun cotton blanket uh, to get over to the, to the other side. Nowadays, they just buy a red parka that they'd gotten secondhand in the village market. And nowadays, they wouldn't even go across the riverbed because they just use their cell phones because now there's cell phones in the last 10 years. It's all happened very quickly, but everybody has a cell phone, so if they needed to talk to somebody in the hamlet on the other side of the river, they'd just call them up. And if they needed to actually see the person, well, they wouldn't bundle themselves up in the blanket. They'd just get on their motorcycle and drive across in a minute. Um, the village has changed a lot. Um, uh, what was, uh, you know, Brigadoon um, has become New York City. Uh, in some ways, and uh, unfortunately, the arrival of uh, sort of modernity and globalization didn't stop just there. In November, just a month ago, uh, jihadist uh, insurgents came and attacked the office of the mayor, attacked the police station, and attacked the cell phone tower that had been built fairly recently. Uh, and a couple of sticks of dynamite over the course of an evening destroyed these um, three um, 
symbols of the modern uh, Beriba. And so now the schools are closed, the health clinic has been abandoned. Um, the civil register where you would get your birth certificate for your newborn baby is, is shuttered. Uh, and many people have fled on their uh, donkey carts and their ox carts. I think there's an ox cart back in one of the pictures uh, here. Uh, and that's the story of Beriba in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, I was very privileged to work with David uh, for about a decade. Um, leading, uh, the two of us led a, led a study abroad program in the, in the village. Uh, and I, Diane said David, you know, was in transfer. David loved, 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 loved Beribah. He was so excited to be there. And uh, he would uh, wake up so, I mean, he'd be up at the crate even before the light came out because he, and then, you know, I rarely saw David in the village because he was always out doing photography. He was just, uh, uh, he just enjoyed it so much. And people in Beriba loved that he loved the village. So he had, you know, very quickly within three or four years, he knew more people than I did. Everywhere he'd go walking around, people would say, oh, David, David, David. So um, anyway, he was acutely aware, as, as many photographers are, of the, of the passage of time and of capturing you know, time and, and light. And, and this series, I think he, he undertook to enable uh, us to sort of see the beauty and uh, experience the emotions that, uh, that anybody, whether a newcomer to the village or somebody who's lived in the village for a long time, uh, that anybody experiences when they, when they see this architecture without people when they see these landscapes without um, people. I think it's a, there's a, there's a powerful emotion that I think anybody, whether a newcomer or somebody who's lived in the village experiences, and, and that's nostalgia uh, in these uh, images. Um, uh, this Ancien Village uh, provokes nostalgia when, when people are from the village are seeing it afresh. And I, I think it, when they see these images, they, they think of being 11 years old. They think of walking around the village with a slingshot. Um, they think of climbing a ladder when you're 11. Climbing a ladder is a big deal, but they think of climbing a ladder up to the roof and standing on the roof of any one of these um, buildings and hearing a donkey braying, uh, hearing the pigs grunting underneath, uh, hearing a dog barking in the distance. Um, and then at night, when you climb up on the roof, you hear the balafon. Uh, and you have the moon and the stars and the balafon music off in the distance. And that's what I think a lot of these images uh, uh, bring up in anyone who has had the opportunity of traveling in uh, West Africa in these villages. So I just wanted to say a few words like that. I'd be very happy to talk. I'm an economist, so I can talk much more about sort of history and economics and stuff like that. But uh, Thank you very much for being here today. And I think, Diane, do you want to come forward and see if we have any, any questions? Or? Do you want to say anything more about the, the war, the current war? Well, I, I, I'd love to see if people wanted to you know, ask questions, what specifics. Like yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just curious about the libraries and what the collections are like, what people are interested in reading about. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, people are very interested in reading stories that are very close to them. So I would say is it, it, almost everyone's a first generation reader. So adult literacy right now in a village like Beriba is probably only on the order of 10% of people over 25, 30 uh, are, are literate. So schooling was pretty restricted until the 1990s when the government really started building out schools uh, everywhere. So most of the adults haven't read. So the kids going to school now are first generation readers. Uh, in schools, they have very little to read. Um, so the first thing that readers like that are comfortable and enjoy reading is stuff that's close to them. So there's, there's a big literature in West Africa of young person tales. Uh, at Favel, we have a whole project where we have uh, a bunch of authors from a town nearby Beriba who are writing stories, and we have a great illustrator who illustrates them. Um, but people also like to read, and in high school, they have to read Germinal by Zola. <laughs> and if any of you have read that, can 
if it was a drag for you when you were 14, <laughs> imagine what it must be. <laughs> I would add that um, during the years that Michael and Leslie and David organized a study abroad program to the village, students from Santa Clara and USF came and took a photo class and spent time in the village with a project making a photo book. And those books were printed and donated to the library. So people in the village can actually come to the library and see <coughs> their own homes. And, oh, someone did a bread making project. And the, the, they, they wrote the text as well. Their French needed a little, <laughs> little editing to yeah, before well, we printed them, yeah. but, but they did a good job. And uh, so they can, the, the villagers can read these stories in French. The, there, there was one on uh, jokes and sayings that mm -hmm. was quite Proverbs helpful. and Proverbs, yeah. riddles. Yeah, Amy. Can I add something to that? Yeah. I had a chance to visit in 2009 with my mom, my dad is David Bates. Um, and when we visited lots of the libraries, what stood out to me is that um, those books that we were, cre we were creating in French were also translated into many of the, the local languages. Yeah. So they're, they're, although French is one of the national languages spoken, there are many, many um, <coughs> smaller languages that are recognized um, mm -hmm. and are spoken in the village. And so there was an effort, I think, which is really great to support the, the local languages as well. Yeah, Bois, Mosi. And uh, Jula. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Amy studies languages, and she was going around tape recording everybody, <laughs> learning the Jula. Can I just add that you know we we have had a lot of people who wanted to get into books, and, um, even though Daniel Steele was very popular at one point in the libraries in French. Um, uh, we realized pretty quickly that that it was really um, sort of bad outcomes that the book market was saying. Yeah. So so we. we Yeah, there's some great, if you're uh, graphic novel fans, uh, Marguerite Abue uh, has a, a, a series called Aya de Yupugan from Cote d'Ivoire. And those are, we, all the libraries have that series. I think she went up to six volumes. It's a great uh, BD graphic novel if you're, if you, you know, you can find them here in the Portland Library, I'm sure. Um, well, and I want to hear from you, but um, the library also runs reading camps and they have a lot of games and puzzles. So yeah. it becomes a, a, a community center mm -hmm. yeah. in a sense that's really valuable. Yeah, you have a question. Um, were there other photographers <coughs> other than David in the village? Is, is that the right uh, term mm -hmm. to use? Mm -hmm. Were there native or indigenous photographers that did similar work or other work or a community of such and such? Do you want to talk about Adrian and Warren? Yeah, um, let's see. David mentored some young photographers, um, and one, one of them is named Adrian Bitibali. Um, he later was able to go to Belgium and get a, an advanced degree in photography, and he is back in Ouagadougou now. Um, he, he's a terrific photographer. He has organized a, uh, a, a photo festival, it's called Photosa, that honors photography in West Africa and has special projects for women photographers in West Africa. Ouagadougou is the capital, so this next month in March um, of this year, this festival is occurring and they've um, created a tribute to David Hayes as part of that festival. So that's been lovely. Um, there's another photographer who's uh, named Warren Sarre, who was not based in, in the villages, around the villages, but he was based in the capital. Um, and he has, he has worked for, he's taken photographs of the president's wife, he was the... He was the official photographer for the former president, so he's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, he's got connections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but he's a good friend. Um, he traveled, actually, to California and spent three or four weeks with us traveling around and looking at, at photography. He, he um, liked to say, to be a photographer is to be a witness to one's time. And 
David liked to quote Warren's line and to, to say that he would like to be the, photo the, the witness for the village of Barabat. So, so was there any, did, did people have personal uh, cameras and they would take pictures of their family and you pass them along? Was right. there any of that culture? That not so many. Only very recently. So cell phone coverage started around 2000, just around the time when David, you know, we started our study abroad project. Yeah, yeah, in the 2010. And smartphones only came in about a few years later because most of the country still on 3G. So 3G, it's hard to use a smartphone. But increasingly, people started getting smartphones. And, and then the one thing about smartphones is built-in cheap camera that's extremely yeah. effective. Yeah. So people inc now, you know, very common so to be before, doing that. there was no film. There was no film history well, for people. There's there is expensive, here. though. Yeah, this photograph yeah. here yeah. shows that there were family photos on this wall, this mud wall. Grandfather, the same guy when he was young and then when he was older. And people whose family members had been in the military often had a portrait that had been taken as part of their military service. They would have that on their wall. But what David would always print um, five by seven images of everybody that he had met, that he had photographed in the village. And then the following year, he would bring the photos back and distribute them. And there were people who said, I've never had a, a photograph of myself before. What, there's this lovely story he used to tell of the guy who, he saw him in the market. Two years later, he pulled out this package from, from under his robe, and he showed that he had the photograph in it. And he said, I carry this with me all the time. <laughs> Oh, and then the, when he went back the last time, one of the village elders had died, and they asked David to please hurry so he could film, he could photograph the funeral. And they had made large prints of photos that David had made every year of this very esteemed elder, and they used those as part of the, the funeral ceremony. So now I think people have um, photos of their self, but it was pretty rare in those years from 2007 to, to 2016. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I was curious. Um, there's quite a bit of love on uh, David's part for Barabbas. Did he, in that period of time, go beyond that village and look at some of the other villages and take some time with them? And which villages did they? I'm familiar with you. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Popio? Do you know Popio? Popio? So Popio is another village about um, 15 kilometers, I think, uh, north of Beriba. And there's, that's where one of the healers was. Oh, yeah. So he was going in. Uh, I've never seen those, actually. <laughs> he, he, he was photographing the, one of these uh, traditional healers uh, who he became very friendly with. Um, and Karba is about uh, 15 kilometers away. He also did uh, a whole series outside in a place called Tabtinga, outside of Wagadugu, where there was also a quarry. So he, he was, it was doing- It was the mud, it was the adobe brick yeah, type of quarry. Yeah, right, the sun-dried, yeah. Sun-dried, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, well, uh, Diane and he and I think Amy, you guys went up to Dogon country. Uh, for uh, one before the war, um, and he, I don't know if he ever did a series from that. No, he didn't do a series, yeah. but yeah, we drove through um, Burkina Faso into Mali and then did, did a trek through this gorgeous portion of Mali that has uh, cliff dwellings, and we, we stayed, we slept on the roofs, mm -hmm. as, you, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we climbed those ladders that you see there and slept on the roof and um, then would hike to the next village. And there, <coughs> the villages immediately around Baraba, um, most of them have libraries because they asked for libraries after mm -hmm, they were mm -hmm. so impressed. So there's a town called Hunde that's fairly close to the main road and then several other towns. Kumbia, Boni, uh, yeah. And then mm -hmm. Bobo Jilatso is a city 
not too far away. So um, he was particularly interested in, in the village and the, the way that, that modernity was coming to the village and that you could, you could really pay attention to, to the fact that we, we shouldn't romanticize this past that um, is stable forever because that doesn't exist, that modernity and tradition always are, are intersecting. So he was really interested in the way that, that the village was changing and the way that that helps you attend to the idea of time, tradition, and the modern world. Is, you mentioned that he has photography still in his file on the rituals and the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of when that could be viewed? Or will that be somehow placed for viewing someplace? You know, I sent to Michael the funeral yeah. materials, yeah. So uh, the, the, Diane mentioned this, this funeral, so um, the son uh, of the man who, who died is, uh, has been a colleague and a friend for almost 25 years. Um, and uh, so he's planning to write a text for that. Um, and as soon as he <laughs> gets the text, uh, we'll, we'll try and print that in a, in a sort of a photo book uh, like this. So yeah, it was really quite striking images because uh, this man had been a former tirailleur, uh, you know, in the army, uh, the French colonial army. And uh, so everybody turned out for his funeral. It was pretty amazing uh, spectacle that they organized to send him off. Uh, so David recorded all of it. Did he really? Yeah. So is that there's more of those rituals and ceremonies that he has on file someplace, is that right? Beyond that. Yeah, this is a plan for my retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to think it would be terribly fascinating yeah. to see all of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a, a rich cache mm -hmm. of material. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and Michael and Leslie are great partners in this because they're connected with the, all the West Africa Studies programs in, at, that mm -hmm. in, in the U.S. and so good, good uh, opportunities for collaboration. We have our religious newsletter from the Department of Africa Library as well. Put it out there just because anyone wants to see the sorts of things that we do. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 So David is doing photography. <clears throat> what were the two of you doing? The three of you doing? Sounds like maybe some scholarly work. And Leslie does environmental studies, geology, geography. Geography, yeah, yeah. I was getting David as expressor every morning because he needed this. <laughs> 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 Actually, I, I, it's a reverse. You know, David introduced me to the, the little Italian espresso makers. I was like, this is so great. <laughs> I'd, I'd grown up in a coffee-less sort of household. So, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I was doing a sort of a variety of socioeconomic research projects. Yeah, and I would go out in the morning, and David would be out before me and back in the afternoon. <laughs> He talked about how every photograph at first, the first year was a, a 10 to 15 minute negotiation. I'd like to take your picture. Why would you like to take my, what are you going to do with my picture? And he, so he, he had pretty deep conversations with the, the help of a translator from the village or with Michael and Leslie. Um, and that really helped him get to know the, the community and then bringing photos back. Um, deepened those relationships. Is it typical for these villages to have Western scholars, you know, spending time there and doing work, or was this unique to Areva, or how did, how did this phenomenon of these Western scholars yeah. and artists showing up in Areva come to be, and how typical was it for you know, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
My, uh, my PhD advisor, I did my PhD at Berkeley in economics, and my PhD advisor was from India. And he used to ha tell a little anecdote that uh, when researchers went out from Delhi to do research in villages around Delhi, the villagers would sit down and say, oh, you've come to do research. Is this for a PhD or a master's degree? <laughs> would be the, the first question they would ask, you know, of the researcher. <laughs> you know, how, how seriously should I take you? Um, I don't think Burkina's there yet, uh, but they're, they're, you know, they're, the, the University of Ouagadougou is the main university, and the PhD students there have to go and do field work too. So actually, in one of the villages near Beriba, there was a guy who had grown up in Beriba who was doing his PhD field work in archaeology and history uh, in that other village. So there's people from all different backgrounds coming and doing you know, research. Uh, this particular area of Burkina is, is relatively neglected because it's a little bit far away from Ouagadougou. It takes about four to five hours to get out there. And, and so the area around Ouagadougou, probably there's many more researchers who are sort of going out for masters or for PhDs and doing, <laughs> doing their research. Um, people are comfortable with this. You know, uh, one of the most, the, the f usually there's a couple of books that are billed as the first books of Burkina Faso, the first published works by authors from Burkina Faso. And, and one of them is by a guy named Nazi Boni, who is a Bois, member of the Bois ethnic group, uh, who was a prominent politician in the 1950s. And his book is called uh, Crepuscule des Temps Anciens, the, the, the Twilight of the Ancient Times, of the Olden Times. Uh, and it was published in 54 or 55, uh, one, of those, one of those years. And everybody in the region knows about this book and this author. Very few people have read it, though, because it's not really in print anymore. So all of our libraries have it, and that's one way that people sort of get access to it. But it's kind of an ethnography of the olden times, but in the form of a novel. And so anybody who's literate is... I think pretty comfortable with that idea of, oh, you're writing about things to, to share with others and maybe with ourselves or with the next generation. Um, so I don't think there's any you know, particular controversy about this idea of you've come to learn and to listen and to share. Um, at least I, I like to think that. <laughs> it, it, the times now are changing, so the, the Burkina's in an active civil war, and the civil war is pitting an insurgent group that, uh, that's very shadowy, that's often referred to in the press as Hani, the homme armé non identifié, unidentified armed men. These are the perpetrators of this civil war, unidentified armed groups. Uh, and my friends in Burkina will all talk, they'll all use the same word to describe. They'll, they'll use the word sikos, c'est la sikos. It's where we've been traumatized. We, we don't know how to trust anyone psychosis, anymore. Psychosis. Yeah. 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 Well, it's not, it's not quite psychosis. Uh -huh. It's like a feeling of not being able to trust other people. You have to read, you, you don't know how to read people anymore. Are they talking to me because they're gonna come and attack me later at night? Is that why they're talking to me? So that's probably changing. I haven't been back to Beriba since 2019. It's been attacked now, and so there's no, you know, there's no safety there anymore for, for people in the village, so. Yeah, please. I just had a question about the kind of categorizing Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> someday I'll try. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's a, that's a great uh, question. Um, 
Th there are many classic West African novels that people know about and have heard about. Uh, there's a wonderful novel from Senegal called uh, Une si longue lettre, a, a very long letter, about uh, a woman in a polygamous, uh, polygynous relationship, and she's, she's leaving that. And she's sort of writing a letter, it's fiction, but you know, writing a letter about her experiences in this, in this household. Um, there's a, an aventure ambiguë, an ambiguous adventure, which is a novel about a, a kind of a typical novel for West Africa about a young person who leaves the village and goes uh, uh, to to the city and the set of misadventures in the city, and he learns the lessons that the wise elders were trying to <laughs> to tell him before he left to the city. But he had to learn them through the school of hard knocks, I guess is what we'd say. Um, so, so there's lots of that kind of classic, I guess, uh, would be called realist fiction. Uh, and only recently, in the last uh, 10 years, you know, many of you are probably familiar with this Afrofuturism yeah. movement. So that hasn't really hit West Africa yet. It's more of an English-speaking uh, South Africa. And, and so we're really looking forward, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Uh, you know, kind of that wave come through French West Africa because I I like science fiction a lot. And, and uh, we have a project. So yeah, so our project for this coming year is to start writing very um, very early um, reader sci-fi stories, and uh, and print them locally and have local authors be doing it and illustrators. So we're you know we maybe we'll catalyze a little bit that process. So we hope. So that's, yeah. I'm also curious about, uh, for, for the huge pop portion of the population that doesn't read, if you had any audio books or, or reading, like I know in, in Sicily they would do these puppet shows that were the story mm -hmm. form, like El Curioso, that you would go you know, every night and see another chapter. I don't know if you're doing anything orally like that. I, you know, we'd love to. It's all, you know, management time and capacity. So we, we try to stick with uh, books and reading. We see that as our, you know, that's our value added. Uh, um, but like, uh, you know, I, we, wonderful that Diane supported uh, Adrian uh, Bittipali's photo exhibit. So, you know, something that also we'd, uh, you know, Burkina can desperately use, you know, the arts in general and, and all its, there's a lot of traditional arts festivals. There's a little bit less on the modern arts uh, support, you know, at, at the, at, from the Ministry of Culture and other entities that would be supporting like nonprofit entities like this. So um, that's the kind of thing that's, you know, always in demand, um, um, you know, eternally uh, in need, uh, especially over there. Well, thank you. Oh, one, another? Yeah. Well, I wanted to pick up, I was curious about this idea of media other than written media. You mentioned that literacy rate is only 10%, and that's high relative to you know, historical. Um, so uh, I don't really know if I have a specific question about that, but you know, you mentioned art. Obviously, I would guess there's you know, oral traditions or how stories are transmitted and communities communicated. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to know if photography has become that way, perceived that way as a way to transmit stories, to, trans, to, to transmit meaning. Um, books obviously will take on that role ultimately. It'd be interesting to, to study that and just sort of like the, the role of these, these media that are relatively new to this community and how, what function it's serving for them you know, culturally. Uh, I, the question I do have is in this specific is, you mentioned the Twilight of the, by, the Bygone Days, which I'm seeing here on Wikipedia. This is the Ancien Village. Is there, is there a theme in, in the stories of Burkina Faso related somehow to like the past and, and modernity and preserving the past or recording the past or making sense of the past in the context of the modern experience? Or should we read anything into the fact that that book is called Twilight of the Bygone Days and this is the Ancien Village show? Or is that just his death? This is Diane's area. <laughs> <laughs> Dis disenchantment, right, is the, that's the theme, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I think it deserves more thought, and maybe we can follow up on that. But, I, you know, I think what 
I think this is an example of a culture that has gone through a rapid modernization, much more rapid than the, the than we've seen here, where there's been a fairly gradual shift. And yet, we I think we still feel in, in our culture that there have been sudden changes that are hard for us to come to terms with. What um, Michael's right, this is an area that I've thought about a lot. One of my dissertation projects was to work with a, a professor who had written a book called The Ability to Mourn, and his thesis was that Western culture, but this would certainly be true of, of other cultures as well, had gone through such a dramatic shift and no longer had the overarching meaning systems that had previously made sense of the world and that there was an inability to mourn that had caused social unrest and, and sort of disturbance and that we are, if we become able to mourn and grieve those cultural losses, we, be able, we become more capable of forming communities that are meaningful. So, you know, I think you could extrapolate from that, maybe it's another dissertation project for someone to think about, um, and probably for someone from West Africa to, to, to sink their teeth into that kind of question. How are those cultural changes um, influencing us, and, and is the ability to mourn something that makes sense in other cultural contexts? I don't know if that's... I just wanted to add, in walking around the Ancien, Ancien Village with, yeah. um, with David, um, not only is um, sort of modernization affecting you know, culture and things like that, but the big buildings are falling down. Yeah. They're going away. And that's sort of, I think he really wanted to capture that. Because you can kind of see how um, the whole village structure is kind of changing in Burkina where people are moving out into what we call the suburbs of the village. Yeah, I think that's right. They, the walls are crumbling. They're being repaired. People are still living there. But yes, they are. The younger people are leaving. They younger people are leaving. Yeah. yeah. The rapid urbanization is a, a, has a huge impact on, on the village. Yeah. You've been very patient. <laughs> you've, had, you've had terrific questions. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much.